I'm a social anthropologist by training, although I try and be as interdisciplinary as possible in my work, which mainly concerns urban development issues. And more specifically, I have two major interests. One is the dynamics of conflict and violence in cities, and the other one is the politics of urban spatial organization, and in particular the way in which territorial governance occurs both from the top and from the bottom. With regard to the first of these interests, urban violence, I've been carrying out longitudinal ethnographic research on gang violence in Managua, the capital city of Nicaragua, for the past 15 years. I go back regularly to this poor slum where I spend extended periods of time interacting with the local gang, into which I was ritually initiated, but that's another story, and also with local inhabitants in order to try and get a handle on their experience and understanding of violence and how it affects their lives and the ways in which they're constrained by it, but also the ways in which it plays more constructive roles in their lives. The other major strand of my research on the politics of urban planning um, is in many ways the top-down uh, flip side to the bottom-up work I do on gangs. One of the most striking things about Managua is the incredible process of urban transformation it's undergone in the past two decades, um, including in particular its comp the complete rehauling of its legendarily abysmal road network. From 2000 onwards, the Managua municipality uh, started a massive program to rehaul this road network. So it filled in the potholes, it replaced traffic lights with roundabouts in order to ensure that traffic uh, went by much more securely and uh, much faster. And it also built a variety of new roads, um, bypasses, flyovers, and so on. Now, ostensibly, the logic of these transformations was in order to um, help with uh, traffic and sort of uh, speed up traffic and, and reduce congestion. But a very different logic emerges when you look at these transformations on the map. You suddenly see that the roads connect the airport to the presidential palace, to the new malls, to luxury restaurants, hotels, gated communities, and so on. So in many ways, the logic of this, of this transformation has been to, in, to securitize a city for the rich, enabling them to actually move between the different locations of their life in safety without being impeded by potholes or traffic lights. Now in my work, I've described this as a process of socio-spatial disembedding of the city, whereby a whole layer of the urban fabric of Managua has been ripped out of the general patchwork quilt of the metropolis for the exclusive use of the rich, who now live in what you could call splendid segregation. Such processes of social, of, uh, social segregation and spatial segregation are of course not new nor specific to Managua. Uh, in some of my more recent work, I draw a cross-historical comparison between Managua's urban transformation and the famous Hausmannization of Paris in the 19th century and the way in which that process completely transformed that city. But we don't even have to go as far as Paris in order to sort of see the way in which urban planning fundamentally impacts uh, on urban life. The Mancunian Way, just over there, for example, was built in the late, early 1960s. The logic of it was to actually sort of relieve Manchester's city center of congestion and traffic. However, the way in which it regulated traffic and really funneled the traffic in the city in particular ways has kind of isolated certain boroughs and areas of the city. Hume, for instance, just a little bit over there, uh, used to be, um, at least in the, before the 1960s, was very much industrially and socially connected to the Manchester city center. But after the building of the Mancunian Way, it found itself increasingly spatially, economically, and socially isolated from the rest of the city, to the extent that by the 1980s, it was one of the most deprived and crime-ridden areas of Manchester. It's an interesting example, a local example of the fundamental ways in which infrastructural transformations and urban planning can have both intended and unintended consequences, and very much condition the way that we live in cities. The more we know about such processes, the actors involved, the potential consequences and the kind of different factors that condition the way in which things can get together, the more we'll be able to actually try and make a difference uh, on city living, which is after all the condition of the majority of the world's population today. And this is where I think the Cities of Manchester initiative is very exciting because there is nothing better than comparison to get to grips with such processes. And the City of Manchester initiative really brings together researchers both in Manchester, uh, across the university, but also beyond Manchester, in order to exchange views and eventually collaborate, in order to try to get to grips with the fundamental processes shaping cities around the world, both 
um, in Manchester, outside Manchester, globally, locally, past and present.